Well, um, we've been looking at a lot of views across wide landscapes, and I thought it would be interesting to hone in today on a sketchbook that Mackintosh uh, carried with him when he took the ferry over to Arran in 1895 and sketched some flowers close up. Uh, we saw how he sketched with uh, Archibald Taylor, that was mentioned this morning, and it's worth remembering also, of course, that Joan Eardley herself drew plants and flowers. So that, in, in a way, is my little jumping off point for taking a closer look at the two very interesting flower drawings in this sketchbook. So there you see the sketchbook, there's one, Bog Violet, and on the other side we have um, the, the foxglove. Uh, can you, you see, all right, I'm not um, filling up the screen with pictures or anything obliterating. Okay, uh, good. Well, we are looking at these flowers with Macintosh with the, the kind of intensity of focus that we might expect from a botanist capturing the florets full on and also in profile and the leaves from different angles, almost as though Macintosh is trying to understand them with a scientist's eye. And he's clearly uh, delighting in the complex visual patterns that the petals trace as they unfold from tight little buds in the bog violet view on the left. Uh, it's worth mentioning that, of course, he's turned his sketchbook vertically to capture each of these um, studies. So we're looking at the sketchbook uh, turned on its um, vertical axis. They're very delicate, these drawings. Um, in the sketchbook, there are a number of others. He used it um, both in Scotland and in Kent. So uh, these are the two that are on Aaron. And it's interesting that he includes the Latin name for the bog violet, Thinguicula, or so he spells it actually with a Q, which isn't quite right, but never mind. Uh, and it's almost as though he's a botanist on a plant hunting excursion. He combines uh, the view of the couple of or three small bog violets in the top with this kind of column of, of more detailed studies of the flower heads as such in, in the lower page. Uh, it's almost as though like botanist, he homes in with a magnifying lens. Aaron was, in fact, a favourite haunt of botanists in the 19th century. James Bryce's 1872 Geology of Aaron and the other Clyde Islands includes a botanical section uh, where he comments that to the botanist, Aaron is scarcely less interesting than to the geologist. And Bryce says, such is the the luxuriance and variety of its vegetation and such is the rarity of some of the plants contained in its flora because of the mild wet climate that he thinks Aaron has more botanical species than any other district in the west of Scotland. Well, a few years later, 1875, we find the third edition of the botanist Roger Hennedy's Clydesdale Flora, even including special notes by a botanist from Kew on Aaron's Flora. And this expanded edition, Hennedy explains, is because of what he calls the continued progress of a taste for botanical pursuits amongst the young men of Glasgow. Hennedy was professor of botany at the Andersonian University in Glasgow, and it's kind of tempting to speculate that Mackintosh, or perhaps his father, who was a keen amateur gardener, might even have attended some of Hennedy's popular botany classes, given that word pinguicula, which, as I say, kind of implies a, a botanical interest. Anyway, we can certainly imagine Mackintosh disembarking at Corrie, just like those young men of Glasgow described by Hennedy, and we can see Corrie written, oops, can't get my mouse in the right place, there are Corrie down at the bottom left, and again in the um, picture of the foxglove, he, he signs Corrie along with the name of the foxglove and so on. Uh, we can imagine him disembarking at Corrie then, scrambling with delight through its lush vegetation until his eyes arrested by the foxglove spire and in some rather damper corner probably the purple um, bog violet also known as butterwort. Well although the foxglove you're looking at here is almost certainly a common foxglove we can't be absolutely certain if the butterwort is the the humble pinguicula vulgaris or the more uh, uh, unusual lilac coloured version that um, also grew on the island. I don't think it really matters. What's intriguing, um, I think, in looking at the uh, bog violet picture, just moving on a little, here we are, is that we don't actually see 
be the aspect of this plant to which Charles Darwin had given so much attention and that's perhaps most interesting for botanists, namely its leaves. And you can see them here in this photograph and in a period uh, botanical illustration. The leaves exude a sticky substance that enables this plant to trap insects. It's a British answer to the Venus flytrap and its beautiful purple blue flowers are borne on fairly long stems, five to ten centimetres above its leaves, uh, and the leaves then cluster at its base, and that's a bit of the flower that Macintosh, as I say, intriguingly misses out. Instead, it, it's the architecture, if you like, of the flower heads themselves that seems to fascinate him. It's almost as though he's finding a wild equivalent to the nasturtiums that were typically set, floral artists in training, to copy uh, Fontaine Latour's nasturtiums, for example. Um, this painting in the South Kensington collection what's now the Victorian Albert Museum, was used to train um, floral artists. And the, you can see this sort of similar architecture, as it were, of the flower head. Um, it's a logical step, perhaps, from observing that floral architecture, architecture of the flower head, to making architecture that looks organic, as so many aspects of Macintosh's buildings uh, do, in, in, uh, at least in his early career. But there's another aspect to Macintosh's pictures of the Aran flowers that I think deserves attention. Whether done with an eye to botany or as an exercise in flower drawing, they're also, after all, an implication of the process of exploring a terrain, of getting to know a place in detail by walking, scrambling, strolling through it step by step, plant by plant. We're not gazing at Aaron from a distance, at the grandeur of its mountains and skyline with an eye for the wide romantic vista, as William Dice does, for example, in, in looking at Goat Fell uh, in the mid-19th century. Instead, uh, Macintosh is giving us something almost Ruskinian. John Ruskin had advised artists to, quote, go to nature in all singleness of heart, rejecting nothing, selecting nothing. And that doctrine had inspired, of course, the pre-Raphaelites. We can see it reflected indeed in the close up detail uh, down in the bottom right, um, which I've singled out. Sorry, it's a bit pixelated, but you get the idea of nothing less than of Old Violet uh, in Millet's portrait of, of Ruskin. It wasn't done on Aaron, this portrait, uh, done elsewhere at Brigger Turk in Scotland, but um, there's still that, that little flower pops up. Uh, in fact, Ruskin himself had made many botanical drawings from life or, or detailed studies, at least, of plants. And he used these as illustrations in his books about architecture and nature. He's, he's just an example here. But Ruskin also saw nature as a source book of symbols, a place filled with meaning. And we know that Mackintosh, the architect and designer, greatly admired Ruskin's writings and approach. A few years before Mackintosh's Aaron flower drawings, he had in fact written what's thought to be a review of Ruskin's Stones of Venice. We can therefore assume that he would have been very well familiar with Ruskin's interpretation in that very book of the foxglove as a deeply symbolic flower. So here's what Ruskin says in The Stones of Venice. The foxglove tells us that our life is a whole, consisting in youth and age, of flowering moments and dying moments, of buds and seeds, of uses and needs. It is not one big blossom, but a whole plant. Its wealth reside, resides in its wholeness and the relation of all its parts to the whole. And he goes on to elaborate by explaining that the foxglove shows, quote, imperfection is in some sort essential to all that we know of life. Nothing that lives is or can be rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part nascent. And that's what Macintosh captures, of course. There's the little bit that's already withered. There's the bit that's yet to come into flower. These are the flowers, the bells in full bloom. And a little detail then of them sort of coming out one by one. Uh, so um, Ruskin um, argues from this um, kind of process, the foxglove blossom, a third part bud, a third part past, a third part in full bloom is a type of the life of this world. And in all things that live, there are certain irregularities and deficiencies, which are not only signs of life, but sources of beauty. 
No human face is exactly the same in its lines on each side, no leaf perfect in its lobes, no branch in its symmetry. All things are literally better, lovelier and more beloved for the imperfections. Neither architecture nor any other noble work of man can be good unless it be imperfect. Well, in 1901, Mackintosh is going to echo that in this well-known panel of text where he says there is hope in honest error, none in the icy perfections of the mere stylist. In other words, imperfection, a la Ruskin, has to guide the artist. But I think already before this, in his tall Aaron Fox glove spreading through two whole pages of his sketchbook turned vertically, we see a kind of long continuum of past, present and future and of imperfection and perfection that Ruskin had evoked. As I've mentioned, the tiny buds at the top, the opening buds, then the, the, the withered flowers at the bottom. It's almost a cinematic sequence. <laughs> Certainly the prominence that Ruskin gives to the foxglove as the emblem of this artistic ideal of imperfection in his Stones of Venice book is thought to reflect his own admiration for Wordsworth, the poet who had written in his autobiographical poem, The Prelude, of how a foxglove he comes across and one by one, upwards through every stage of its tall stem, this Thing had shed its bells and stood by the wayside dismantled with a single one, perhaps, sorry, this is my final line, um, uh, let's see how well I can quote from Ruskin, I, from Wordsworth, I have to read it. Anyway, the final flower then left at the ladder's top. Wordsworth's romantic image here is firmly melancholic, there's not much of his foxglove still in flower. By contrast, Mackintosh's Aaron foxglove is remarkably complete. There's only a couple of flowers at most at the bottom that have yet withered, and there's very little equally still to flower. You might say that in its tall magnificence, it's the perfection of Ruskinian imperfection. It's certainly rather different from the study of a foxglove that he made at Ascog on Butte in the same sketchbook, so in the same year, 1895, which is definitely more at the, the Wordsworth end of the spectrum. Indeed, he includes a little sort of study of, of the withered floret of it, or a withered floret of it, almost in a botanical vein at one side of the picture. Uh, you have to see, again, he's gone over two pages here. The Corrie drawing, however, the one on Aaron, as I say, seems to emphasise the size and the splendour of, of the Aaron flowers that Bryce had um, described, uh, attributed to Aaron's damp climate in his geolo geological botanical book. Further, bearing in mind the way that Mackintosh's Aaron foxglove celebrates birth and life, we can surely now begin to understand why he includes a stylized foxglove in his famous poster for the Glasgow Institute of the Fine Arts that he carried out just the year after the Aaron drawing. And I'm very grateful to Joseph Sharples, the Hunterian's Macintosh curator, for drawing my attention to the fact that there is a foxglove present in this poster. You can see it's this strange thing here. There's a young woman clasping this long stem and it has three foxglove flowers just opening out and then equally uh, the, the withered remains of other flowers. So surely we have here a kind of allegory of the source of beauty of which Ruskin had written the foxglove whose irregularities and deficiencies, that phrase again from Ruskin, the dead as well as the living flowers were, again quoting Ruskin, not only signs of life but sources of beauty. The Glasgow Institute of the Fine Arts, which is the subject of the poster, was renowned for exhibiting up-to-date modern art. So the work of the Glasgow boys, not least, Mackintosh seems to be, uh, as it were, paying tribute to its role there. And we might even ask if the young woman is actually Mackintosh's future wife, Margaret MacDonald, a personification of her, a personification of this new modern beauty. There's certainly something of a facial resemblance to the dark hair when you look at period photographs of her. In Mackintosh's later flower drawings, of course, made after his marriage in 1900 to Margaret, he often included both their initials as if to suggest that the very image is a collaboration. There we have CRM plus MMM. Uh, it's been suggested that Margaret may have coloured line drawings made by Mackintosh, but 
who knows, with their shared love of flowers in mind um, that they clearly uh, had, it's tempting, I think, to speculate that already in 1895, exploring Aaron up close through its flowers, and sketching the foxglove that he was going to use in the poster a year later to celebrate beauty in modern art, Mackintosh's thoughts may already have been not so far from Margaret. It was, after all, in 1895 when his engagement to Jesse Kepi ended and he devoted himself to Margaret instead. We find, shortly after Mackintosh uh, married Margaret in 1900, a uh, definitely purple and strongly Ruskinian passage in a lecture by Mackintosh, in which he argues, art is the flower, life is the green leaf. Let every artist strive to make his flower a beautiful living thing, something that will convince the world that there may be, there are things more precious, more beautiful, more lasting than life itself. The flower of art, he says, therefore must be the flower of the art that is in you and that personal that that highly individual interpretation of the flower that he encounters in nature is clearly what he's already trying to do in those foxglove and bog violet drawings on Aaron with their step beyond mere botanical exactitude and it's certainly what comes through in his poster with its weird foxglove uh, symbolizing beauty uh, grasped by a woman who, who resembles Margaret. In conclusion, though, I'd like to return to the bog violet, for, as I said, it's an insect-eating plant, and its interest to Darwin had thus been the way in which it seemed to cross the boundary between the plant and animal worlds. And with this in mind, even though Macintosh didn't focus on its insect-trapping leaves, it's only logical that a few pages later, in his same 1895 sketchbook that he's taken with him to Aaron, we find a plant that is also a woman. Here, the upper one, this strange figure sort of dissolving into something that looks like spiraling tendrils with a bud or something top of them. In other words, the idea, an idea, perhaps the earliest idea for what became Mackintosh's famous rose lady motif in his Buchanan Street tea room murals. And there you see his design for those with the um, rose uh, becoming the woman, the woman becoming the rose. And also sort of funny little purpley things, which I like to think might be uh, metamorphosed bog violets, perhaps. Art and life, not just flower and animal, are made one in these murals and indeed the lady again has dark hair. Uh, his visit, Mackintosh's visit to Aaron, I'd like to suggest, was thus a critical moment in that evolving vision of unity between the human and the plant worlds that Mackintosh developed. Uh, it's one that we can set beside Art Nouveau in France with its organic style of architecture and also the Vienna Secession in Austria who were of course to invite Margaret and Macdon uh, Margaret MacDonald and Mackintosh to exhibit with them in 1900 and whose leader Gustav Klimt entwined the plant and human world so evocatively in the kiss of his Beethoven freeze in 1902. However, I'd like to finish with a puzzle, and this is a kind of over to you moment because, again, I'm very grateful to Joseph Sharples for bringing this to my attention. Um, we have a very interesting page in the um, workbook of the McDonald, of the Macintosh um, architectural practice, the Honeyman Kepi and Macintosh architectural practice to which Macintosh belonged. Uh, and on that page, it says, as you can see, memorial seat, Loch Ranza. Now, there seems to be no record of this having been completed, or if it was, where was it? Did it ever get carried out? It was for some patron, as you can see, um, called Robert Bowes. Uh, I wonder, does anyone know anything about this? It's certainly tantalizing and fascinating to think of this um, entry, which came tonight through our wonderful Macintosh architecture project at the University of Glasgow that Joseph was involved in um, and that Pamela Robertson led. Um, it, it's fascinating, I think, to think of Macintosh designing a seat a memorial seat where you could sit amongst those flowers on a hill somewhere in Arran. Anyway, there we are. Um, uh, as I say, a fascinating footnote perhaps, but an intriguing one. So thank you very much for, for listening. I hope I haven't run over just too long. Thank you.